Welcome, and thank you for joining our final session of Philadelphia Magazine's ThinkFest 2021. I'm Ernest Owens, Editor-at-Large at Philadelphia Magazine, and today I'll be speaking with Tahib Smith, an entrepreneurial genius, and Abdul Ali Muhammad, co-founder of the Black and Brown Workers Cooperative, and a trailblazing freelancer. Before we get started, we have a quick word from our sponsor, St. Joseph's University. And a tiny word with so much power. At St. Joseph's University, we are a community built on and. We're up for anything. We have passion and purpose. We are strong and resilient, revolutionary and timeless, crimson and gray. We are St. Joseph's University. Discover your and at sju.edu. Thank you to St. Joseph's University, along with our other sponsors, Bank of America, Penn Medicine, Western Governors University, and GoPuff. Thank you for joining us all week long for these conversations. If you missed any sessions, you can view our recordings at phillymag.com slash thinkfest. And now for my conversation with Taib Smith and Abdul Ali Muhammad. Hey everyone, I'm so glad to have you all here for this great conversation on how to change the conversation. Um, I wanna start off with um, introductions. Um, Abdul Ali Muhammad, could you tell us who, a little bit about yourself followed by Taib Smith? Sure thing, uh, my name is Abdul Ali. I'm from Philly. I am a co-founder of the Black and Brown Workers Co-op. I do a lot of organizing around uh, returning remains to descendant communities uh, displacement politics um, and workplace violence. And I'm happy to be here in conversation with Taib Smith and with you, Ernest. Uh, hi, uh, awesome. my, name, my name is Taib Smith. Uh, I'm a third generation Philadelphian, uh, I like to say proudly. Um, I'm, uh, I, I'll also say I'm the son of Bill Smith and Sheba Dahomey. I, I, I feel it necessary to, to mention my parents um, because they they are responsible for uh, my outlook. So I'm a businessman um, focused on social impact. And um, I think, yeah, I'm partners in, in several ventures, but I think for this discussion, I'm a proud Philadelphian and citizen. Uh, absolutely. Um, so for this conversation, I mean, for starters, you all both from Philadelphia, um, which I think really is important about having this conversation about how to change the conversation. Because, you know, too often a lot of new people, you know, transplants, people like myself, um, oftentimes get to talk about what's the future of Philadelphia or what needs to change. Um, and I think what was really important about this discussion is hearing from people who are making change in Philadelphia as, um, you know, born Philadelphians. This city has a wide majority of people that come here, stay here, and don't leave. They're born here, they're going to die here. And, you know, that's interesting because major cities, this is the second largest city on the East Coast under New York City. But what's interesting about it is that so many of its residents are hometown, home-born and grown people. Um, but when you look at a lot of the stories and a lot of the coverage about what's the future of Philadelphia, a lot of it are people like myself who graduated from Penn and stayed. Um, so what do you all think? I mean, for starters, um, what, what do you think is the element of Philadelphia that makes people stay? Like what made you all just stay? You could have went to DC, you could have went to Boston, you could have went to Atlanta, right? But what made you all stay here in Philadelphia? Mm, mm. So I, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on that because to be honest, uh, for 20 years, people told me that uh, you're talented, you should go to New York. Or like, you're really doing things and you do things in other cities, like you should move to LA. And over 20 some years, I've seen some of my best friends, colleagues, uh, mentors be displaced from Philadelphia chasing careerism. Um, but to be frank, many of us cannot afford to buy homes in the neighborhoods that our uncles, aunts, uh, aunties um, fought to maintain, um, you know, community. 
So I think there's an algorithmic displacement to, um, you know, our best and brightest. And I've heard a lot of people say across generation that Philadelphia eats its young. Um, and I think, and now that we're headed towards, you know, the highest murder rate since 1990, which, you know, ironically, I went into the military um, because I didn't know what to do. And I didn't um, want to matriculate straight to Temple when I was uh, leaving high school. And it pains me that, frankly, I wouldn't have the success that I, that I have today if I wasn't dedicated to space and community. And I didn't work with um, people across sector to create the equity that I have, whether it's in my co-working space and pipeline, my real estate ventures, or my uh, marketing company, Lil John Creative, that's been around for 15 years. Um, I would probably be an employee of um, another white institution had I transplanted to another major metropolitan market. So Ernest, I really appreciate that you invited me to be in this conversation with another indigenous Philadelphian because frankly, I get invited to a lot of conversations and I'm like the chocolate drop in a, in a, in a big pool of milk talking about the future of Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. And there is a space where we all have to be careful about being um, placed in a space of exceptionalism, right? right. So as an entrepreneur in a city that is 43% black and 67% POC, the fact that according to Pew, only 2.3% of the businesses in the city are black owned, you know, I have a responsibility to community that a lot of my white colleagues cannot imagine, right? And that, right. that, that disparity would not exist without structural racism and white supremacy. But through the lens of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that same level of careerism, or placing people in spaces of exceptionalism, we get a move removed from transformative work that would make it more normative for people like Abdul and I to be in positions of power and positions of creating the future of Philadelphia. Absolutely. I'll thank you for that. Yeah, that was deep. Yeah. I mean, that's a good question, Ernest. Um, I, you know, my, my family has been in Philadelphia since the, my grandfather, my mother's father, uh, was born in Philly, and my mother's mother uh, moved to Philadelphia in the 1930s, the, the early to mid 1930s. So my family has been in Philadelphia for generations. It's home to me. West Philly in particular is home to me. Um, I deeply, I'm deeply invested in the communities I come from. And honestly, there's no other city I would want to live in at the moment. And I might change uh, given what Taib was saying about fast um, and growing displacement of indigenous Philadelphians um, over the past 10 plus years um, and more rapidly recently. But Philly is home to me. It's a, it's a, it's a real city. It's, it's, it's gutta, it's, it's grimy and it's real. And the realism is what, what, what keeps me here, right? Um, I, I don't like the, you know, sorry for anyone who's from LA, but I don't like the pretension of of Los Angeles, I don't, I don't like the kind of um, sh showiness of like New York and Philly is the same, uh, a down to earth <laughs> city um, where I, I, I have deep roots and family. And so I'm committed to, uh, to being here as long as possible. Well, there, <laughs> cause I'm not there now. Right, yeah. right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, following with that, I think, um, just hearing you all's backgrounds and, and how you are connected to family and the, some of the challenges that's making you all think about what's next for Philadelphia. You know, what, what is one thing that, you know, as someone who's homegrown here, what is one thing that you feel outwardly that transplants or just the public at large just don't get about Philadelphia? Like when other, when you hear other people talk about Philadelphia, um, you know, what is one thing that you hear in conversations about the city that you're just like, mm, that's not, that's not right. <laughs> I'll start with you, Taib. So, um, I mean, there could I, be a long list, but what is some of the, you know, the major, so, like, 
happens. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I've, I've lamented about this in different capacities over the years, but um, at the analogy of this, the TV show, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, it, it's, it's really interesting to me because if you spend any time in, in um, Philadelphia historically or contemporarily, the fact that you could have an all white cast with no Asians, no, no Spanish speaking people and no black people in Philadelphia is purely, you know, Hollywood fiction, right? So there's a way that through the lens of tourism and hospitality, that there's a certain Philadelphia yo that represents maybe a portion of Northeast Philly, a portion of the suburbs and a portion of South Philadelphia that, that is fictitious and it doesn't show the full tapestry of all the communities in Philadelphia. And I, I, I could speak just of all, you know, the depth and breadth of the African-American community, but there's also a Laotian community. There's a Cambodian community. There's a, a Korean community. We have a, a Chinatown that existed for 150 years. And there's a white gaze to how we market the city through tourism and hospitality and sports and fictitious figures like Gritty that is disrespectful to my history and to um, many people of, of, of all hues. Absolutely. I want to, you know, say this before I get into Abdul Ali. You know, when I first came to Philly, I felt like I was juggling between two types of shows, right? You're talking about, it, you know, It's Always Sunny in Philly, which is on FX, but then I'm also thinking about, you know, all of the references for Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, the theme song, and, and that. And, you know, for me, I was, you know, when I came to Philly, I was wrestling between, is this a city, you know, there is this diversity in what we know for reference, you know, I know about Eve and these famous artists that have come through Philadelphia, but then there's also this very much so outward facing, you know, I, I, I you know, I felt like based on some of the shows and things I watched, it was kind of like a mini Portland. And then when I got to Philly, I was like, wow, this city, okay, there it is way more diverse than what TV gives in and what the tourism guides give. There's a lot of different mixes and flavors as Abdul was speaking about earlier. There's that grittiness, there's their rawness, there's a lot going on here. Um, and so, yeah, to, to, to you, Abdul Ali, what do you think is, you know, the misinterpretation of Philadelphia as someone who's been here all your life? I think that Philly is, a, you know, a, th a, th a throwaway city. I think a lot of people devalue the, the like you said earlier, the, the homegrown kind of talents that exist in Philadelphia. And sometimes they appreciate the music or some specific person or group like The Roots or like, a, you know, I'm gonna mention Will Smith because, you know, he was just in Philly, I guess, right? <laughs> um, but it, when it comes to the, the, you know, the community pockets here, people, I think, devalue um, the communities here and the people who live within those communities. Um, and like you said, value, you know, the, the transplants. And that's politically, if you look at the politicians, a lot of the politicians aren't necessarily born in Philadelphia. Um, when it comes to write it, writers, when it comes to whatever um, cultural production in Philly, a lot of a lot of the people in Philadelphia aren't as valued. And I think that that should change because there is creatives, there there um, are thought makers, um, um, and just you know homegrown talents that I think don't get valued um, and that get missed. So I would say that that is a misconception that you know the talent here is mostly from transplants. Let Very me know cool. if my internet I mean, is slow yeah. too, because- No, you're good. Oh, okay. I think so. Um, you know, I think one of the things that's important also is that a lot of the talent that comes out of Philadelphia, we know Philadelphia has talent because we see it, you know, on Netflix movies with Kevin Hart. We see it in everything that Will Smith has done. We see it with the continuation of Eve's career. You know, we see all of these different individuals who are from here go off and you know go to LA and New York and, and it's interesting because this city continues to have such a large community of people that have stayed but then there's many who have went off and it's exported their talents elsewhere. Um, there's various conversations that have been had in recent years about why there has been this interesting retention of Philadelphians and, and, and what narratives are being said about what's going on in Philadelphia. 
Um, you know, we are the poorest major city in America. We are now second in um, gun hom homicides and gun violence after Chicago. And a lot of people are making the argument that some of those elements is what's really making that barrier there. But I mean, there's, there's a, I think a, 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 a bunch of different reasons why, but I'm curious to hear from you all about what do you think is creating some of that, um, you know, I guess distance between people staying or going in Philadelphia, especially natives, especially people who are not putting their children in the Philadelphia um, school systems, public school systems. You know, what, what do you think is, is some of the elements there? So I, I'll, I'll jump in there. When, when I was much younger, um, there were spaces that we were able to be creative and um, we foster community. Um, uh, there are people like uh, Rich, Rich Medina and Bobito used to have a, a record store near Third and Market where people would do uh, poetry slams and you could buy, you know, all kinds of like, you know, locally made items. Uh, I can remember going to spaces like uh, Wilhelmina's and the Five Spot where um, Jill Scott uh, would try out songs to an audience before she even had a record deal. I remember um, a more welcoming uh, tapestry of spaces where black and brown people and frankly queer people were able uh, to flourish. And if I walk around Center City today, um, it is not welcoming to black and brown people from an aesthetic perspective. Um, there are very few spaces that uh, show uh, black art. There are very, very few spaces where you will hear, you know, even the tapestry of music that is homegrown. Um, I, you know, I could, t I could walk up to a venue owner in my twenties and on a, tell them I can bring you an audience on Monday or Tuesday if I play house music, right? Today, contemporary in the city, um, all cities are going through such a, such a high level of hypergentrification. You put on the Eagles game and give a, a, a city special, it's gonna be packed. It's not really um, generative to arts and culture that is welcoming to you know, a, creative, a creative community. So what happens? Black people, um, people of color who are high functioning uh, begin to seek out opportunities in other spaces, right? Now, there are a lot of complications in that because that is you not, not unique to Philadelphia. Um, I, through some of my work, um, I've been able to look at the same issues in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Chicago. And, um, you know, we are operating in a contemporary economy like nomads in, re in regards to space. And I think I I'm fortunate because my naivete brought me into real estate because I would go around and ask people in real estate, how do you do um, development without displacing people? And some people would shrug and tell me that, have you ever played Monopoly, kid? That's the game, all right? And through my naivete, I knocked on enough doors where I learned how to, you know, do commercial real estate. And I'm focused on creating more pathways where we can actually have equity in space so that we can create safe space. So the more people can, can create spaces where they can nurture and grow their own businesses. Because if you don't have ownership, you are food on the table. Right? And I think to go back to some of the reasonings, we are the poorest and most diverse city in the Northeast of the United States was the most populated area of the country. And even resource people are being displaced in terms of home ownership in markets like New York. So there are aspects of our community that are food in a game that is not designed to our benefit. And in a city with third graders read 30% of third graders read on grade level. And we know we build prisons on the estimates of black youth in urban environments. We are not doing the work. You know, and when I say we, that's a very big we. That's a cross sector. That's in municipalities, that's in academia, that's in, in bureaucracy, that's in philanthropy. Um, we are not doing the work to serve denizens of this city. 
strongly agreed. Abdul? Yeah, I mean, I think when I, it's so difficult to talk about because there's so many intersecting reasons why Philly is not only, uh, you know, a city with deep poverty, but a city that is, is um, hypercarceral, right? Like there's so, in terms of incarceration, look at the percentage of the incarcerated population in Philadelphia versus other cities is extremely high. And, you know, as someone from Philly, like Taib, I, I know what, what reasons that is. I mean, not just the history of redlining, but the disinvestment um, in black youth in this city. I mean, from, a, from, a, from the grade level up, right? Um, the, uh, the way that black young people are surveilled and, and, um, and, tra and, and tracked in our city um, from middle school on up, right? I remember, you know, the gallery, which is still the gallery, I'm not gonna call it, but you know, the other name. But um, back in the day uh, <laughs> where, you know, you could, you could gather and um, there was some, you know, surveillance of you in that space. But if you look now, there's no real place in Center City where young Black people can gather and not be followed by bike patrol. Um, and so you have, you have young people who grow up being criminalized from a young age. And then we're shocked when, when violence happens. Um, that you know they're they're not enough, right? They're not valued throughout in terms of schooling. Look at our school system. Look at um, the conditions of the schools, right? <laughs> it doesn't tell young people in the, in the city that they're valued or cared for. Um, and so, when you have that kind of environment where you grow up in, um, what 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 expectations do people have um, when when that is the 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 nature of what the 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 society they live in, um, and, and that's also shifting rapidly where people are being squeezed out of homes, um, pushed to Upper Darby, pushed to the Northeast. Some people move out to, to you know, the Carolinas. And so you have a less of a sense of a, of unified community and you have pockets of families here and people who are, in, who are connected to each other in other, in other neighborhoods. Um, I don't think that that, that kind of, society um, is one where we can expect anything else. Um, unless something radically changes um, and young people are invested in and seen as, um, you know, a, a, a valued kind of, a valued piece of our community, I, I, I don't know if that'll change. Um, you know, and it's um, optimistic people like Taib who, um, as a black person who is investing in cultural production and creating space in Philly that's owned by black people um, to be able to, to, to show young people that there, there is um, folks in our community that are um, staying here um, and investing in our, in our, in our neighborhoods and not leaving hmm. and going elsewhere. I, I, Abdul, you just reminded me of, of two tremors. I'm not, I'm not, um in terms of thought and something I talk about on repeat, usually when people ask me to speak at University of Pennsylvania, ironically, is that when I was uh, about 12 years old, I lived at 52nd and Chancellor and I used to ride my bike to University of Pennsylvania. And on a hot day, I attempted to walk into the Penn Library because can, you know I didn't understand the library could be private and I wanted to go look at books. And the young white woman at the front desk and the black security guard had to explain to me that I wasn't allowed entry into the library. And when they walked me down the stairs, I never saw a pen in the same light. All right? And I can tell you more that happened after that story. But, you know, in front of Pipeline during the school year prior to COVID at um, 15th Street between Market and Chestnut, the um, charter school students are let out of school between 2.30 and let's say four o'clock. And the police bicycle cops, as you mentioned, Abdul, are brought in yep. all the other precincts to kind of corral them to the L and to um, the subway. And yep. I can't explain to you how much it pains me when I hear um, city employees Speaking to Black youth, if they are stopping to talk, if they're flirt, if they're running, as if 
they are wards of the state and they're told to get back to their neighborhoods, right? Now, without areas to feel free, it goes back to that um, carceral state that it puts you in when not only can you probably not afford most of the accoutrements of the developed you know, center city, but to be told to get, get your little black ass back to your neighborhood is a very painful um, construct that removes you from feeling a sense of community or a sense of participation in your city. And I think um, a lot of my well-meaning colleagues who don't have that lived experience to juxtapose with our contemporary reality have um, a perspective that doesn't allow us to move forward with the cultural competency to actually change the conversation. I think um, all of us spend too much time in rooms catering to white fragility versus actually working on the change. Yeah, it's very heavy. And I think that a lot of the things that you are both were talking about, you know, stems from a lot of, you know, deep trauma that Philadelphia residents um, have had with the city and government that continues to show up in different ways. Um, you know, this year, Abdul Ali, you know, you lifted the lid off on a lot of the issues around the move bombing, which is now <laughs> it's been over 35 years. And there has been issues in history there with remains. There's been history, you know, there with families not feeling like they've been given proper adjustment or the space to grieve. Um, questions that finally got answers years later, resignations and more. And um, I would like to hear you talk a lot more about what that experience was like dealing with the move remains, you know, trying to have that conversation amidst everything else that was going on in the middle of a pandemic and other racial uprisings and whatnot in Philadelphia. Absolutely, thank you for that. I mean, to talk about uh, shocking, jarring and emotional, you know, it was, um, it, I had a visceral response uh, when I found out that the Penn Museum was holding the remains of Tree and Delisha Africa, two young people bombed, uh, you know, in a police in a police bombing in 90, 1985. I, you know, it was, you know, we talked about this a lot, Ernest. It was something that I didn't expect to to find, to find out, to to witness, to write about. Um, when I mm -hmm. first started talking about repatriation of remains of Africans held at a uh, museum. I thought it was um, ancestors who had died a long time ago, over a hundred years ago, um, that we knew that Penn Museum held um, in the form of crania um, in a Morton collection. I didn't know it would be a contemporaneous, um, you know, they would be holding contemporaneous remains of young black people um, and using them for, uh, for study uh, without the consent, without the knowledge of families. Um, and, it was disturbing to see, to see, to see that, um, and to write about it um, was uh, whew, deeply emotional. I was um, recovering from COVID at the time. I mm -hmm. had just, yeah. I'd just been um, uh, diagnosed with COVID nineteen, and I and I found out um, uh, that the the pin held the remains and started to try to quickly uh, find find out as much as I could about it and write about it, um, and so. It was a, a deeply traumatic experience as someone um, who, you know, writes freelance and had to kind of prove that this was newsworthy to people, right? Um, like this, this story needs to be told. Um, this is important, um, and I'm the person that should do it. And you know the background story about that, Ernest. But yeah, it was. Um, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm grateful that we were able to get uh, uh, the the parents notified. Um, and, mm -hmm. and bring this um, awareness to this issue because this is a, a deep issue of uh, institutions holding on to, to what doesn't belong to them. Um, and they should return those remains and other artifacts to those descendant communities um, because that's what, that's what they should do. And I think, you know, what's important here to note 
and you know we've had those conversations and I think that what made this very different and you know you came at it in a, in a freelancer perspective but also as a resident um, and someone who's lived here you know this is this is your city and this is a part of the area where you was you know you grew up and so there wasn't you know would you say there was that personal investment in making sure this story and this conversation was being had in Philadelphia but also having nationwide I mean this story went international and I think what I would I guess it would be safe to say clearly that what drove a lot of your passion to make sure it did happen that it that it was considered newsworthy right was because of that emotional and personal investment connected to your Philly roots to tell this story I think you know sometimes in, in different um, newsrooms that I'm working in and you know, writers I'm collaborating with sometimes when there comes certain stories um, you know that lack of personal investment um, can make the difference between something getting seen and not being seen or a conversation not being told. You know, you did a lot of direct action, of course, and advocacy around neighborhood racism. And, you know, when I was covering that, there was that element of personal investment because I was also Black and queer. And also someone who had lived in Philadelphia long enough to see the, the changes that was happening in those neighborhood um, bars and spaces and out, outside of that. But for someone else, another colleague or peer or someone else who may or may not have been from that community, they would have said, you know, this can wait, you know, because what we found out later in the reports um, in response to the move reports that did come out um, this year from legal teams and from the city is that this story had been something that many other journalists had known about prior. And, you know, had you not been steadfast in your personal investment um, as a Philadelphian to help get this story out there, who knows how many years we would have waited um, to see that. So talk a little bit about um, that personal investment and I'm gonna to go to you, Tai. No, absolutely. I mean, my, I was a year and some, some months old when move, the move bombing happened. Uh, my mother obviously lived in West Philly at the time. She grew up at, uh, you know, at 46th Street at the, you know, um, in the projects. And so, um, very close to where um, where the bombing happened. And so I remember growing up as a kid, hearing about what happened in 1985 and feeling, um, you know, a deep, deep, uh, deep pain about the fact that a city would, would bomb black people. Um, and so when, when I heard about the move remains, it was definitely deeply personal to tell this story, um, having grown up in 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 the city post um, post 1985, um, and and hearing the stories of 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 move and hearing the stories of how um, they've been criminalized um, and targeted and and murdered, and so um, that that definitely drove me and drives my writing most of the time um, a deep kind of connection to the story and also a a want for for something to happen. Right, I always want um, something, some kind of action to happen, which is why I've been writing about repatriation for a few years, and it just became, an, you know, a thing after the uprising. And you know, I wrote about right. in returning remains in, in 2019, um, and at the time, people didn't didn't see the importance of it. Right? It was like, what? What are you talking about? The more cranial collection. Well, we did over here. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you understood, and other people understood, Taib understood, but I think largely it didn't become a story um, until 2020, until after the uprisings, um, after you know the, the state murder of, of George Floyd um, and Breonna Taylor, um, is when people started to reckon with the question of 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 um, of, of uh, monuments, of of remains. Right. Um, connected to these institutions. And that's when it resurfaced the demand that I made initially in 2019 around um, taking the remains out of the, the glass cabinets in archeology span course, um, courses um, on Penn's mm -hmm. campus, um, and then returning those remains to descendant community. So it's a deeply personal reason why I, I do the work I do in the writing that I do. So thank you for that question, Ernest. Absolutely, and I, and I wanna, um, Really quick. Connect these dots. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, because a couple thoughts. Um, when Abdul was speaking, I, I had to recall my my first memories of Move were in '78, 
And I remember my mother and I were staying briefly in Powhatan Village and me asking her, I was holding her hand while there was a police car following us and her telling me they think I have dreadlocks because she, she had braids, right? Um, you know, I can remember during the move bombing, I was staying in Camden on Cooper Street and I watched the fire, I could see the fire burning in West Philadelphia. And I, I probably watched TV for about six to eight, six to eight hours uh, that morning. So when you talk about, you know, throughout the day, watching the watching coverage and watching um, our collective trauma, right? And um, when I think about that, I also have to think about my youth uh, of the Frank Izzo, Frank Rizzo era and the, the, the kind of trauma that people in the black community still hold in regards to uh, aspects of a police state. Um, and then I, I have to, uh, you know, Abdul, there's so many different times, whether across my timeline or reading an article or looking in the background of a protest that I, I started to, to joke and I'd be like, there they go. All right. I, I mean, from um, during the Blackwell uh, uh, era, uh, I remember uh, some instances yeah. where I was watching a video and you were in like in the heat of it. Right. City Hall protest. Uh, yeah, I, I remember when, when you were attacked by uh, police officers, um, when the Proud Boys or the Promise Keepers were in, in Center City. I was astonished that when when I looked in the fray and you were you were right there. I think I had called you um, because I was concerned. But you know, I think when there was an article about Penn years ago um, denying their um, trust came from the sale of black bodies, I discovered that from you. All right. So when we're talking about freelancers and, and people who are spending their own like labor and time and, and intellectual um, capacity towards, you know, frankly, what's right and, and just, I have to think about how many resource people sit on their hands and use rhetorical, hip hip hypocritical language about being just. Um, and, you mm -hmm. know, I, I honor you. You know, do you know what I mean? Like you have, you are a Philadelphian. I am very proud to know. Thank you. That means so much. I appreciate that so much. Yeah, and I think it's interesting um, from a generational perspective, right? You all both are from two different generational tiers, and are, you know, using your talents and your skill sets to really change the conversation around Philadelphia, and create impact in different ways. You know, Abdul Ali do it through writing through direct action, through community organizing and mobilizing. Um, Taib, you do a lot of different socioeconomic justice projects and you know, changing and disrupting the way that we think about real estate and creating spaces um, you know, for black and brown people and for, for locals. Um, can you all touch on why you know, you're propelled to do what you do in the, in the styles that you do? Because too often I, you know, when I'm covering, you know, social justice and social impact, I always hear from people who oftentimes aren't from Philadelphia or just completely detached from the conversation to say things like, you know, there's only one way to do it, or, you know, protests aren't enough, or, you know, we can't develop our way out of this and we can't vote our way out of this. And I agree, I think that one, there's no magic bullet to this, but for the particular, um, you know, tools in your tool shed that you're using, to you know, change the conversation and make change. Essentially, what, what, why, what drives why you do what you do? Um, and I'll start with Taib, and then I'll follow with you, Abdulli. You know, um, I I have a certain responsibility, and I have a certain I've I have learned a lot, and I'm unlearning um, simultaneously. But I have. Uh, a privilege in being able to have the autonomy um, and freedom that I do. Um, and with so many of my brothers and sisters who don't have that autonomy or freedom, um, I have a responsibility to create more space for people who share 
our um, journey. Um, and whether it's my parents, my ancestors, the community that wrapped its arms around me, I can't um, be in the room transactional thinking singularly. I have to think about all of the people whose um, shoulders that um, carried me here. Thank you for that, Taib. I mean, Ernest, you know my story, you know, working in, in nonprofit spaces um, where I try to do, to use other tactics to support the communities I come from. Um, and I noticed that those, those uh, spaces didn't honor, didn't um, reflect, didn't um, invest in, 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 in the vision that a lot of the frontline staff had who were mostly black and brown um, when the leadership was white. I knew that something had to happen. And so I was kind of moved um, into organizing by the, the, the workplaces that I was in and, um, and found it necessary to disrupt the, the status quo in that way. And so um, I, I think I found direct action political theater very um, not only effective, but, um, but necessary um, to push some of the kind of the movement that, that uh, that I was invested in. And I think that that continues now. I see direct action um, and disruption in that way as critical to change, um, to changing the, 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 the consciousness of people, because at that moment you're confronted with, with what's happening um, to the communities um, that I'm a part of, and it creates a crisis of consciousness uh, for people. Uh, and that, that, that crisis of consciousness moves people to, to reflect, to think about um, their own complicity and whatever it is that I'm organizing around. And I think that that's an effective tool. Um, and, and, you know, there's so many tools to be used um, and it's not the only way, um, but it's one of the ways to, to affect change. Um, you know, and I get criticized a lot over the, I've been criticized, you know, Taib talked about the, the Blackwell, <laughs> yeah. um, protest. I mean, people were yeah. very critical of um, that the work that we were doing because of the way that mm -hmm. we organized um, with, within the Black and Brown Workers Co-op. Um, mm -hmm. What I know is that without that organizing work, we wouldn't have seen a shift in um, the political landscape of West Philly. Um, and it was, it was definitely time for, for um, a change. Um, and a, a conversation wouldn't have elevated to where it did around displacement politics, right? That's right. Um, everybody was talking about um, council person prerogative after those yeah, protests. So it, yep. it, it was effective in what it needed to do to, to continue that conversation around how people are being displaced and how uh, public land is being used and, and decided on um, by council people. So I think it was um, effective. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the direct actions that we did and also it ruffled feathers because it is, it is, um, it isn't about respectability. Um, it's about, you know, confronting, um, uh, people in power, um, to, to be accountable for what they've done. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I guess, you know, before we, you know, conclude, I have a couple of fire round questions that I hope are fun, but also interesting. Um, both of you all can answer to these. Um, what is something that you, who or what do you think needs to go um, immediately in Philadelphia to help change the conversation for good? I'll start with you, Tahib, and then follow with you, Abdul Ali. Um, so, fortunately, because of our city charter, um, James Kenny is already going, but um, I think there are a lot of people who are going to be running for mayor. Mm -hmm. We need a we need a change. Um, as you noted, I think we were at twenty two percent last week in voter turnout. Yes, uh, less less than twenty two percent. I think it was twenty one point six percent of people voted in the November uh, general election in Philadelphia. Right. So. Um, you know, we have an, an infrastructure that is still left over from some, from some, some Frank Rizzo ways. Um, mm -hmm. I, I just saw on Billy Penn this morning that 
hiring of uh, black and Hispanic executives is actually down and um, decision-making positions within the administration. Um, we have to have a, a, a more imaginative, innovative, high functioning administrative move, administration moving forward. And I think we really need an engaged populace to demand that this next race is competitive. And there's a certain level that I'll be frank of bullshit that can no longer exist in this city. And we can't have an infrastructure that is designed for the benefit of you know, international capital or you know, frankly, our suburban rims. We cannot invest in infrastructure that makes the city a playground for people to visit and, and fly to but you know, black and brown youth uh, still have ab abominable schools. Um, you know, we have city employees who may not be able to live here will be displaced to the suburbs. You know, um, poverty is rising in the suburbs. We have to have a, a more imaginative region, um, and there's a lot of work to do. And um, when we when the world starts, I want to see less galas. I want to see more organizing. I want, and I don't necessarily mean protest, but I mean, in terms of trying to uh, reimagine how we have a functioning metropolitan region. So your, so your answer shortly is less of the elite socializing and fraternizing that has defined the city um, within its networking scene. You know, I wrote about that and more serious community organizing and mobilizing moving forward. Uh, yeah, across, across sector. I mean, for, uh, okay. like, um, there's a misnomer that people think, you know, all business is, is political, right? So right. Um, we have to demand, you know, across socioeconomic stratus that we have a safer, more functioning city where, where children are better educated and people have the opportunity to prosper. Um, and we cannot... Um, exist fractured um, and live in silos and believe that just because, you know, things are good in Ritt Rittenhouse, that things are going to automatically get better above 52nd Street or in right. Southwest Philly. Yeah. So, Abdul, same question to you. What is something that needs to go <laughs> immediately? Uh, needs um, to go. Who or what uh, to, to get us changing the I would, conversation? I would be, the, you know, police commissioner policing young people um, that's happening in the city. Um, you know, that, that that's something I'm deeply impassioned about is um, creating, um, you know, community models for uh, safety and not investing, continuing to invest in a vision of um, a police solving our problems. Um, and if I had to say, you know, someone in like, <laughs> like Taib said, Kenny is, it's going out as mayor, but I really, I really want Kenny to go. I want, I want our politics to be in Brady too, um, and and I want our politics. Bob, to be, uh, former Congressman Bob Brady. Yeah, for, former Congressman Bob Brady and the, the the Democratic City Committee. I think that we have a city where there's so much. So we need to tap in, into our imagination, like Taib said. But politically, if you look at our politicians, they're not. None of them are inspiring to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to feel inspired um, by our political leaders. And I think that there's so much um, that could be done to, to really tap into communities who were disinvested in voting, like you wrote about Ernest recently. Um, they're not inspired by <laughs> the polit political leaders that they see. Um, um, so why, why, why vote? <laughs> in many cases, um, you know, people are thinking. Um, and so, yeah. We want, we want leadership that inspires and moves and, and um, is, is radical and wants to change because Philly needs a, a shift in the way that the political landscape is. Mm. Wonderful. And our final question, um, uh, real briefly, this is your takeaway. What is one thing that you think every Philadelphian, every person watching this, listening to us chat today, what is one thing that you would recommend a Philadelphian do to help change the conversation in their own right? What is some takeaway that like right now, 
you say, listen, this is what you can do in your own right to help change the conversation um, and, and you know, make Philadelphia a better place. I'll start with you, Taib, and I'll close out with you, Abdulli. Everyone can be mentoring somebody. Everyone. You know, regardless of where you are in your uh, journey, everyone could, could probably find somebody to assist or lift up. Um, and and I, I genuinely mean that because I, I have benefited uh, from mentors and your mentor doesn't always have to be somebody here. You know, it could be somebody in the back office. It could be somebody in the mailroom. It could be somebody just um, to bounce ide ideas off. But um, we, we, we need to reach over, reach down and um, lift each other up. Um, and I think there's a lot of resource people who are not thinking about how they might be able to um, diversify their sector by reaching out and attempting to lift someone up. And closing it, closing it away, I'm taking it away, Abdulli. Yeah, you know my answer is gonna be, it's gonna be organized. Organize the people closest to you, talk to them about the critical issues that are happening in the community. Um, and you know, there's a lot of community solutions to problems that we have. Um, and really right. just getting people to talking about it and invested in organizing around something um, is deeply meaningful. And it doesn't have to be uh, a direct action in a way that I may do it, um, but you know, organize in the ways that you know how, and also trust your gut, trust your deepest knowing um, when it comes to, to things happening in the workplace or, uh, um, you know, that's I follow my, my gut around what I should organize um, about. And that goes from crania to, uh, to institutions um, like nonprofits, et cetera. Thank Absolutely. you. Everyone. Thank you. So mentoring and organizing, those are the, the, the biggest ways that we all as Philadelphians can help um, change the conversation. Um, thank you both, Tahib and Abdul Ali, for uh, taking out this time to have this great conversation on how to make, uh, how to change the conversation in Philadelphia. And I hope so many people um, watching and listening are, are going to really take this seriously and make some some stuff happen. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you, Tahib. Thank you. Good to see you.